Welcome back to Nightcall. I absolutely love this game. If you'd like to check out the game, there is a link in the description. And uh, we have the choice between three, three, uh, three passengers right here. I'm not entirely sure which one to take, so I guess we'll just take this one. Random, just choosing it by random completely. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing other people's stories and backgrounds and all kinds of crazy things happening. So, okay. Okay, sure, why not? Let's do it. The next passenger getting in your cab has a surprisingly calming presence. He gently closes his door and gives you an address on the other side of the city. You start driving. You sense your passenger wants to talk about the killer. It's simple. Since the first murder, everyone thinks they know something. Everyone thinks they saw something. And this passenger is no exception. Rather chilly out, isn't it? Ah, there's a new clue apparently available in our room as well. His voice is warm and deep. Finally, you notice his white collar. You're not too cold? Uh, we do what we can to stay warm. You've got a lot of grit to want to drive in this kind of weather. The holy water font froze yesterday. We had to pour boiling water over it to break the ice. He pauses for a moment. He looks at the car, the seats, the windows. It's funny. I'd never made the connection before today, but a taxi is kind of like a confessional. A small box removed from the world, where two people can converse without the risk of being interrupted. He waits. You look at him in the rearview mirror. Do people blabber on about their lives? Sometimes. He looks outside and continues speaking softly. I was sure of it. His face lights up. Why, yes, I'm doing exactly what my parishioners do when they come for confession. They start with small talk, the weather, their grandson, granddaughter, niece, their dog, and then they finally get around to what really matters. They share lies, trickery, stinginess. He sighs. I've been listening to people's confessions for over 15 years, and it's funny but no one has ever told me anything really serious. He's waiting to see how you react. Hmm, we could say nothing or we could say no crimes. Let's say no crimes and poke the bear a little bit, even though he seems like a pretty decent guy, I guess. A slight smile on his face. There have been things that are hard on a personal level, but never anything illegal. It's just that the people I hear in confession have so much to say. Of course, we all have things we are ashamed of. Freud clearly understood the importance of the confession booth. He made it into something more modern, more attractive, and less punitive. He pauses. Before going to seminary, I never doubted my calling, but since... He leans in closer. His voice is now lower and softer. Since then, I have a clearer understanding of the world. I can connect religions, schools of thought, ideas. And living in a country that is less and less religious, it's hard not to start wondering. Your passenger makes a sound, like a cork popping from a wine bottle. I have something I want to tell you. It doesn't bother me that people stop believing or believe in something else. Why our faith more than another? He struggles to find his words. What bothers me is that I'm not bothered by it. It's like I've already accepted it. He looks outside. Is there such a thing as driver-passenger confidentiality? He pauses, then bursts out laughing. I'm kidding, but I do wonder what people talk to you about. 
How would you feel about swapping stories? Sure. R really? I didn't think. He smiles. Nothing leaves this car, right? You nod. Who first? You. Of course, it's only normal. There was this old man whose wife died very young. Since she was an avid churchgoer, he continued to come every Sunday morning. He clarifies. You should know that it's rare to see men alone at church. There are couples, lots of old ladies, mothers, young women. Church is not very manly, unfortunately. But anyway, he came. One day, he asked me to take his confession. We sat down, a long moment of silence went by. I usually let them get acclimated to the muffled sounds coming from outside the booth, especially if it's their first time. And there, he tells me that he's in love with someone, but doesn't dare betray his deceased wife. She was everything to him, you see. His son, his oxygen. For the last 20 years, he'd been suffocating, incapable of living alone. He wondered if it was a sin or wrong, or if he might upset his wife up in heaven. He pauses a minute to let a smile spread across his face. I managed to find the right words, but he still wasn't sure and said he'd come back to talk to me again. He stops. He died that night in his sleep. I think of him often. We don't always hear our calling. We avoid our own destiny. His expression freezes. He hesitates, opens his mouth, stops himself, then finally, your turn. You look at him. My story's a bit like yours, actually. It's a story that haunts you. You think about it regularly. And not only because of everything that followed. The night of the terrorist attacks, the other drivers and I were helping people get home. We drove around, waved to people to get in, telling them it was okay, that everything was going to be alright. It was chaos, they all wanted to get home to their loved ones who weren't answering their phones. The slightest odd noise made them jump. Anyway, a woman and her husband got in the car, she wore a headscarf, he was glued to his phone. They gave me an address and we drove towards Rue de Rivoli. The radio was announcing the first estimations of the number of deaths. He started crying. She, she looked at me, stared at me in the rearview mirror like she wanted to read my mind. We'd almost arrived when he told her to take her scarf off, that it would be easier for everyone that way. She refused. He raised his voice. She continued to stare at me in the mirror. A car speeds in front of you. You stop talking. How reckless. You glance at the meter, the green light, your rearview mirror. In the back seat, your passenger leans slightly forward. And what did you do? I nodded, insinuating that she was right, that it would all come down to that. She kept her headscarf on. I pulled over in front of the building. She got out first, walked toward the building without waiting for him. He paid me, lowered his eyes. He takes a second to process the story. He holds your gaze, his hands clasped. Impressive, very impressive. You're saying we should remain proud of and faithful to our convictions. You nod, your passenger smiles, but something is not quite right, as if the smile were forced. Thank you for swapping stories with me. You've almost reached his destination. You notice your passenger has been keeping an eye on the dashboard clock. You park in front of the address he gave you and cut the motor. The passenger pays his fare and suddenly seems lighter, more at ease. 
Good luck. He gets out of the taxi and disappears into a nearby building. And we receive our profits. There we go. That was a slightly, slightly quicker ride than the previous one we did in the prior episode. And so we're going to be taking all of that. Oh, he actually gave us a tip. I don't believe the woman previously gave us a tip, but maybe I'm uh, misremembering. Anyway, let's have a look. The door suddenly opens and a woman gets into the back seat. Having a good night? For a second you freeze. It's one of the cops working on the judge's case. She grins at you. Her voice creaks. You remember seeing her at the hospital. Something already bothered you about her there. You know, it's actually pretty crazy. For weeks I've been saying to myself there's something off about you. Something not so nice. I dug around, mulled it over, bugged all my fellow cops about it, because I was sure you lied to us. Didn't lie. She whistles to cut you off. Hey, I'm talking. She has a cold sneer on her face. I'm going to be frank with you. She leans over to you. I don't think you're the judge. Nah, I just can't picture it. She squints like she's trying to make you out from far away. Like you'd have gone to the extent of hurting yourself. Yeah, between us it's a bit of a stretch. She stares at you. But not enough of a stretch for my chief to stop going on and on about you. Seriously, he talks about you all the time. If I didn't know better, I'd think he had a crush on you. She smirks. No, no, I think he's more interested in your profile. In prison at 17, an icy chill fills your gut. And for murder, too. You open your mouth, but nothing comes out. Since you got out, you've kept a low profile, but you're lying about your name and your address. I checked. It's normal, you'd say, if they get word of your time served, no loan for your permit, no lease for your car, meaning no second chance at life. Her voice becomes softer, almost warm. I personally like guys who want a second chance. No, I like guys who fight for a second chance. Basically, I like guys who are willing to work for me. She leans forward, her shining, cat-like eyes narrowing. My chief wants to go to the prosecutor with a first and last name, with evidence. Actually, knowing him, he's not so hot on evidence. So, I'll give you info. Victims, suspects, medical reports, some photos that are a bit... She makes a gagging noise. You have to be discreet. Keep it between you and me. Interrogate, ask questions, dig around. I'm not a cop. She shrugs. Don't worry, you're already keener than half the squad. And don't forget, I'm not asking you to make an arrest and deliver the killer wrapped up with a bow in front of the station, okay? You're no Batman, you're just here to get me more information. She rummages around in her pockets for what seems like forever. Here, take my card. I'll call you in three, four days, just to check in. We'll chat. And I'll let you know if I have any new info. She takes on a didactic, paternalistic tone, like she was giving you a list of recommendations for the hundredth time. Don't get caught, don't get arrested. Also, I wouldn't recommend trying to leave Paris. I know what you look like, and I know who your friends are. You can either be the solution or the problem, my friend. She takes a minute to scan your face, your emotions. If I have to, I'll go check in on you-know-who. Her smile is biting. That reminds me, she know you've done time? You shake your head. She snickers. Oh, my little dirtbag, you cover your tracks well. I did what I could, or what if I refuse? 
I think we'll say, what if I refuse? If you refuse? Simple. I turn you in. I'll send your picture to all my friends in the media and every asshole in Paris. Your picture with your name on it, your real name. Anyone close to you will have their places searched. They'll be put under house arrest, spend nights in jail. You have any idea how tense things are with that fucker's trial underway? You sigh. You know just what she's trying to get at. Come to think of it, your last names are almost the same. You could be brothers, actually. I'm nothing like that son of a bitch. She smiles. Let me tell you, with that face of yours and your handle, they'll welcome you with open arms. You have no right. Or should we just say nothing? I think we'll just say nothing. She takes on a serious tone, businesslike. I want to catch this killer personally. I want to drag him to court, ruin his fucking life with a bang. I can't botch this case. You got me, and neither can you, right? Obviously. Well, great then. We see eye to eye. So you can just say you're my informant, my CI. You ripped open your gut, you saw your own insides, you were in a coma. Yeah, you have plenty of reasons to want to get back at him. She furrows her brow. Yeah, I think you're actually gonna do what I tell you to do. You investigate, ask questions, listen to all the rumors, and you come up with a list of suspects. She lays her hand on the door handle and freezes. Oh, right, and don't get fired. Without this cab, you're worth nothing to me. You glare at her. Fucking bitch. Or I could just say nothing. <laughs> I think I'll say nothing. She puts her hand up and you can hear the words behind it. This conversation never happened. I'll make sure you get more intel tomorrow. I'll find a way. Until then, not a word to anyone, obviously. Not a word. The door opens, squeaks, and slams shut. Fucking bitch. You sit alone for a while, teeth clenched, dry eyed, ears buzzing. Shit. On the back seat, the cop left a pile of papers. Shit. Key in the ignition, motor running. Radio on, crackles, you turn it off and start driving. Talking to passengers might unlock new documents and clues for your investigation. You will find them back at your studio after your shift. And we have discovered six new clues. You take a second to enjoy the silence of your studio apartment. Outside the city is slowly waking up. You can still hear the hum of the taxi buzzing in your ears. You throw the files Busset gave you on the table. On the wall you hung up the big corkboard where you used to pin up photos of your nephews. They've been gone since you got out of... Your plan is simple. Jot down all the pieces of information and connect them to the suspects. The guilty party won't necessarily be the one with the most evidence against them, but the one with the most compelling evidence against them. It's like you're building a story about each suspect. Trying to understand their motives. Understand how he or she got into this situation. You're suddenly overcome with the desire to sleep. You close your eyes. Press your fingers to your eyelids and let out a yawn. You take your shoes off before getting to work. Alright, so we can have a look at the autopsy reports for victim 3 and victim 4 and we also have the killer case itself or we can go and check the board. And as you can see we have five different people and we have victim 4 heard in your taxi. Victim 4 was a fantastic politician apparently right so let us have a look at the autopsy report of victim four then three new clues have been discovered as a result of that picture of the crime scene we can take a look at it 
As you can see, we gained a new clue from that. Picture of Crime Scene 2, we can take a look at that as well. Picture of Crime Scene 3, I see. Alright, so that's good. That's good to know. And let's have a look at the actual killer case itself. Okay, so that's obviously given us some more clues. We might get some more pictures from that one. No, but we do have a new investigation location. Right, so let's have a look at the board. Okay, so... Whoa! Is that is this actually all correct? No. <laughs> is it? No, it doesn't seem like it. Okay, so I have no idea. Okay, so... Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, okay. So... I see. So message on crime scene three, time is up. And that obviously goes to the medical examiner. So she's obviously the one that ascertained that particular thing. So all of these people have different things that we will be doing with them. You can see this is obviously a lawyer. He is the defender of several molested kids in poor neighborhoods, was a promising football player when he was 10. Seems to be a pretty decent guy by the looks of things. Homeless man with an unknown background. Briefly worked for Charles... Victim 2? Ah, I see. Message on crime scene 2, you deserve this. This guy's obviously associated... Aha, uh -huh, I see. Okay. Retired cop. Okay, so... Mm, interesting, interesting. Okay, so let's end our night then, I suppose. With a heavy hand, you wipe your tired face. You pull open the sofa bed, which unfolds with an unpleasant creak. You collapse onto the mattress. The events of the day run through your head. The streets, the passengers, their faces, their problems. Your brain is running at full speed, your body aches, and you are in pain. You can tell you need to get more sleep. You glance at your investigation board. It looks awfully empty, and are you sure this is the best? It's too soon to say. You shake your head and your mind wanders for a second. And suddenly, you're asleep. You open one eye. Your attention turns to shouting upstairs, a door slamming. Typical. You get up quickly. Then a few minutes later, you're outside of your studio. And I suppose the best thing for us to do right now is to end this episode off here. But as you can see, we have a whole wide variety of different people to go to next. Not entirely sure if they are going to be the same the next time we do an episode here. But I hope you very much enjoyed this one. I know I did. I am very much looking forward to finding out a little bit more about everyone that we encounter. And hopefully being able to solve the case. I don't know how long each case is, but I am very much intrigued and interested to see what happens. If you'd like to check out the game, there's a link in the description. Otherwise, I thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.